Welcome into EP Wealth Advisors Informed Investor Market Update. I'm Rob Black. We do these weekly and I do them with Adam Phillips, CFA and CFP, Director of Portfolio Strategy with EP Wealth. We're into the month of May. Adam and I just did a big event last week where we gave a quarterly market update. So lots of content out there for you to consume and lots to think about with things that are going on in the markets right now. Adam, April was really volatile. We saw the VIX volatility index spike up. What do you make of what we saw in the market actions in April? Well, look, it, it's been a, it was a brutal month. Uh, the you know, markets, as they stand right now, the S&P 500 is down about 13% from where it began the year. Uh, the bond market is down close to 10%. And so what we saw during the month of April was, for the most part, a lot of the economic data was pretty strong. Uh, I think what the market really decided to focus on was a continued what we call hawkish positioning by the Federal Reserve. And there was also, now that we're into the first quarter earnings season, we've seen that a lot of the, the companies that were driving earnings over the last couple of years have, have really given a lot back here. And it tells you that now that we're in the middle of earnings season, these companies are on the hook. They need to deliver and justify these valuations. And a lot of them just aren't doing it. And so that's creating a lot more volatility. Warren Buffett had his big annual conference this past weekend, and he bought a lot of stocks in the first quarter. That was very reassuring because he's a long-term patient investor. Um, I'm a big fan of Warren Buffett's. I wasn't 25 years ago. I was young and foolish. I thought I could beat him, but I've grown to, to see my wrong ways there. Any thoughts on Warren Buffett and what he said this weekend at his big conference? Well, look, I think it's a great reminder that if you're a long-term investor, you need to view these periods uh, opportunistically. I mean, there's a lot of stocks are, are now trading at a discount compared to where they were. And so I, I think he, he really goes about it the right way. I think it's really easy to give into the emotions and kind of look at the day-to-day -day swings in the market. I mean, it's right there. It's smacking us in the face. We're seeing red in our screens and it doesn't feel good. But if you can take a step back and, and ask yourself, are you a long-term investor? Are you investing for your long-term uh, financial planning, retirement planning? Then I think that really helps to center you and, and um, just get you to focus in on, on what's important. We are, you know, we, we continue to, to take that long-term view. And although we just as Warren are, are not saying we're calling a bottom here, I, I think that's the right way to just look at this is saying, I'm not gonna try to call a bottom. Things may get a little bit more choppy from here. This volatility is likely to persist. But it doesn't matter because all that is really just noise over the short term, and we are long-term buyers. It's interesting. We uh, talked a little bit about volatility already, but I want to come back to it. The VIX index is above 30, and it kind of shows that people are nervous. And that's when they kind of get fearful playing into uh, Warren Buffett's be greedy when others are fearful, be fearful when others are greedy. Um, last year at this time, we had the exact opposite. We had 70 market closes at all-time highs. This year, we're getting a little bit more volatility. Can you talk about the almost the apathy that we had last year? We're like, oh, another market high versus, uh oh, do we want to open our screens this morning? It's, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it's so easy to get conditioned to an environment where you're constantly just grinding higher. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't want to complain about markets that are moving up and to the right consistently. Right, fair. Uh, but, you know, it, it was certainly fun. But at the same time, I think we were trying to remind investors and clients that this is not normal. And in fact, what is normal is volatility, like we're seeing today. You know, we're, I, we're about 13% or so from where we started the year. So that's about in line with the average intra-year drawdown uh, going back that the last few decades. You generally see about a 14% decline in any given year. Last year was really the outlier. The biggest decline we saw was about 5%. Mm -hmm. That was really fun to see markets go higher, but we know that volatility is the norm. Can you help me with the negative GDP print that we saw last week? Because I'm not saying it was unexpected, but it kind of was unexpected. But I, I saw there was a lot of data inside the GDP that needs yeah. to be parsed. Well, it was it was uh, it came in a little bit weaker than than most were were expecting, but I, I think that a lot of us were were ready for uh, some weakness in the report. Um, but you know, so on the top line number, what we saw GDP decline one point four percent. You compare that to where GDP was for the fourth quarter at just shy of seven percent. So that's a big change. It tells you that the economy lost a lot of steam there in the first quarter and then some. I, I think the the reason it it 
hit a lot of our screens is because it came at a time when a lot of people are talking about, are we heading into a recession? So now you see a negative GDP print. What does this mean? If you look underneath the hood, which is always really important when you're talking about markets or, or some of these broader economic measures, what we actually saw was that there were some uh, redeeming qualities about this report. You know, the three pillars of the economy, you think housing, consumer spending, business spending, all those were actually quite strong contributed more than 3% to GDP in the first quarter. That's better than they did uh, and, and what they contributed in the fourth quarter. So that's great. So what were the drags? The drags were on these things uh, like, um, we, we didn't see a lot of inventory replenishment. We saw a slowdown in, in inventory building and we saw the trade deficit widen. What does that actually mean? Well, it means that we just imported a lot more than we exported, which I think just tells you what we already know is that the US economy is faring a lot better than other major economies around the world. And so I think many of us have given this one a pass um, and said, you know, I, I, let's focus on the positives here because we know that the, the economy really is driven by those other things that actually showed up quite well in that GDP report last week. Interesting stuff. Um, another piece of economic data that we got last week was the ECI, the employee, employer cost index um, or employment cost index. What do we need to know about this little economic statistic? Yeah. So, you know, when, when we're talking about wage price growth, a, a lot of times we refer to average hourly earnings. We receive that monthly. We're going to receive it on Friday, actually, as part of the jobs report. It's really good. It's helpful. It's timely, but it doesn't provide as as complete a picture as the ECI, this employment cost index. Unfortunately, we just received this on a quarterly basis, but it still tells us a lot more. It tells us about wages and benefits uh, across the broad US economy. And what we saw is that wages continue to move a lot higher. So on a quarter over quarter basis, employment costs rose 1.4%. On an annualized basis, year over year, they were up four and a half percent. So the most we've seen in a long, long time. And I think that just tells you that uh, the Fed is right to be looking at things through more of a hawkish lens. Uh, we, you know, the FOMC meeting, not to jump too far ahead, but the FOMC meeting is this coming Wednesday, we're looking at a 50 basis point rate hike. I think that the Fed is more likely to focus on these rising uh, labor prices um, than they are a, a negative GDP print, because this is really, um, this, this really just shows you that wages are real, if they don't address this and they don't hike uh, hike uh, rates, then we could see what they call wage price spiral, where this thing really gets out of control. And so I think this one really registered on the Fed's radar. It's good to know. Now, I want to repeat and update everyone. If you want to see the quarterly market update, contact your financial planning team at EP Wealth. Um, it's something you and I recorded recently. You have to sign up for it. It's a longer piece than what we do on a weekly basis, and it's really good content, especially your newsletter that uh, people can get as well. Just contact your financial planning team at EP Wealth. Let's get into the final thought of the day, and we, this is going to be a little bit longer one. It's the FOMC meeting this week and the jobs report this week. I think they kind of go together. I would imagine the FOMC kind of has a peak at that jobs report number, so they probably already have some ideas on it, but 50 basis points, it's a, it's a big jump uh, compared to where we were two years ago, per se. Well, it is. And, and you know, normally when we're talking about the Fed raising interest rates, we're talking about them doing it in 25 basis point increments. Mm -hmm. We've seen 50 basis point hikes in the past, but we haven't seen one since the early 2000s. And so just about everyone expects the Fed. They, they've been pretty good about telegraphing uh, and, and, and setting market expectations. And so just about everyone expects a 50 basis point rate hike on Wednesday at the con conclusion of the FOMC meeting. We're likely to see additional 50 point rate hikes from there. Uh, but, but what are we really looking at for uh, Wednesday's meeting? In addition to the 50 basis point rate hike, we're going to get some guidance on, on how the Fed is planning for the reduction in the size of its, of its balance sheet. We know that uh, because of quantitative easing or bond buying, the Fed's balance sheet has more than doubled to about $9 trillion. Well, we, we know that the Fed can no longer justify this type of, of monetary policy support. And so in addition to rate cuts, they're going to start winding down the size of this balance sheet over time. What we don't know and, and what remains to be seen is what impact this has on the economy. You know, bond buying and quantitative easing is really an experiment in and of itself. And so um, reversing that and, and unwinding a Fed, uh, the Fed's balance sheet is an experiment uh, as well. And so we don't know if that will amplify 
uh, rate hikes, if, if that just leads to additional tightening. And so a lot of this remains to be seen, but as always, I think we're gonna be focused on um, Powell's, um, Powell's comments following the FOMC meeting. We wanna hear what he has to say and what he says about the, the uh, future Fed meetings and do they, where do they see inflation going from here and, and how will he respond to the last week's uh, employment cost index and GDP. They didn't comment last week. They were in a blackout period, which is common uh, as you get into <clears throat> the, the lead up to the FOMC meeting. And so we'll get an update from him on, on all these recent uh, uh, measures that we've seen. Now, um, I think it's fair to say that we can talk a little bit further about this because um, as rate hikes have gone up, we're starting to say that they're being aggressive now. The Federal Reserve is appearing to be aggressive. Does that create a win-win situation where they can be less aggressive if the market um, pulls back or if oil starts to fall below 100? Um, do you think it's a win-win? Because on one hand, it should beat inflation. On the other hand, it should give them some wiggle room if they need to back off because inflation takes care of itself. Yeah. Or am I barking up the wrong tree? No, well, I think that's an interesting, it's an interesting question because in the past, what we've seen is there's something that's that's become known as the Fed put. And really what that means is that the Fed has been focused on how the market is reacting uh, to potential Fed moves. And so they could, I, I think to extend that a little bit further, what that means is that they could look at the market turbulence, this recent bout of volatility and say, okay, we don't want to spook investors. We don't want a, a, to see a huge sell-off in risk assets and equities. So maybe we shouldn't hike quite as much. I think that's what, what we, we might've seen in the past. These days, that's not the case um, because what's different about what we're seeing today is that inflation is the highest it's been in 40 years and the Fed doesn't really have a choice but to continue on with the rate hikes. They're gonna disregard the noise from the market uh, and they're gonna continue on in their, in their process of unwinding monetary policy. What we might see later in the year is that right now the Fed is, uh, or excuse me, the bond market is pricing in about 10 additional 25 basis point rate hikes. Uh, for the between now and the end of the year. What we might see is that if they what they call front load these rate hikes, meaning they, they do a, a number of them in these uh, at these few upcoming meetings, they can maybe take a step back and reassess. And maybe by then they will have seen some easing of, of inflation. They will have seen energy prices pull back a little bit. And then maybe they could say, you know what, we were planning on doing a rate hike uh, at the next couple of meetings, but maybe we don't have to now. We can kind of sit and wait and see how this thing plays out. And so I think that is... Uh, it is more likely uh, than them looking at the market to guide them uh, and uh, to guide the course of, of uh, policy. Um, but still, I mean, I, I think what we're doing is really taking it on a, on a meeting by meeting basis. The, the data is going to continue to change. We're going to be watching it. And so is the Fed. And so we'll see where we are down the road. I just want to remind everyone that we just did a quarterly market update, you and I, driven by your newsletter and driven by the work that you do at EP. Um, I'm just interviewing you. Um, people who are watching or listening can go grab a copy of that if they'd like. Um, go with your financial planning team. Is there anything else that you want to throw out before we wrap up today's session? You know, the only other topic that uh, that we didn't cover was corporate earnings. Okay. Um, this week, uh, so right now we've seen about 50% of the companies in the S&P 500 have reported earnings for the first quarter. This week is actually a big one. So in addition to the FOMC meeting, in addition to the Friday's labor, uh, labor uh, report, we're seeing about a third of companies in the S&P 500 report earnings. And so you think about the potential market movers outside of the economic data and, and monetary policy, it's really, we're gonna hear from a lot of companies this week. And specifically, we're gonna be looking about what, uh, to hear about what they're thinking and seeing when it comes to inflation. How is that impacting their businesses? This is a great time to hear from companies. Obviously, corporate earnings is, is really, really important when you think about the direction of the market, um, not just the short-term volatility, but where we, <clears throat> where we go from here and what, what we think the course of, uh, of corporate profits uh, are from here. And so uh, we're going to get a lot of good data next uh, th th this week, and I look forward to uh, just catching up on all that uh, in our next update. Thanks very much. I'm Rob Black for EP Wealth Advisors Informed Investor Market Update. He is Adam Phillips, CFA, CFP, Director of Portfolio Strategy with EP Wealth. Remember, there's a whole treasure trove of content out there at the EP website. Check it out if you want to get more confident in understanding of what's happening in the markets these days. Okay.